What impact will the recent change of government in Iran have on the country and its people? Are Iran's relations with its neighbors and with the West heading towards relaxation or escalation? Welcome to Connections, the Arab Studies Institute's interview program on current events, policy questions, and new ideas. I'm Wain Rabbani, and for this episode, we're delighted to be speaking with Ali Vaez of Crisis Group. Ali Vaez is Iran project director and senior advisor to the president at Crisis Group. Previously, he was the Iran project director at the Federation of American Scientists. Trained as a scientist, Vaez has written and commented widely on Iranian affairs, including for most leading international print, digital, and television media. He is currently also adjunct professor at Georgetown University School of Foreign Service and a fellow at the Foreign Policy Institute of the Johns Hopkins School of Advanced International Studies. Ali Vaez, it's a real pleasure to welcome you to Connections. Thank you very much, Mayan. It's a pleasure to be with you. Thank you. Um, you know, people often take a one-dimensional view of Iran when discussing its policy and politics, uh, limiting it almost exclusively to the future of the Iran nuclear agreement. So I'd actually like to start by looking at its domestic politics, which I suspect is at least, if not significantly more important to, uh, to many Iranians. And in this context, I'd, I'd like to um, ask you about the recent Iranian parliamentary elections, uh, the presidential elections, a change in government. We now have a um, new president and a, um, a new government uh, in, in Iran. And um, I know I've, I've heard you comment that this had been the least free and most restricted election in Iran since 1979. Um, but also that it could lead to significant changes in domestic policy. So I'd be very interested to hear from you. What, what do you believe has been and will be the impact of these elections and the change of government um, on domestic policy and politics? Sure, uh, that's actually a very good way of starting this conversation. Um, you know, uh, the reality is uh, Iranian elections, uh, at least over the past uh, three decades, were always unfree, unfair, but at least competitive. Um, but since uh, last year, the parliamentary election uh, of 2020 and then the presidential election of 2021, uh, there is a, a change uh, in the government's approach towards the elections. It appears that that element of uh, basically popular participation, which was a way of demonstrating the legitimacy of the system, uh, is no longer uh, a top priority for the Iranian leadership. And it all, I think, goes back to uh, the delicate moment that Iran is in right now, uh, where, where domestically everything is about succession. Ayatollah Khamenei, Iran's supreme leader, is 82 years old. Uh, and, uh, you know, who and what comes after him really determines the vested economic and political interests that exist in the system. Uh, and that's, that really trumps everything else, that trumps foreign policy, that trumps uh, nuclear policy, regional policy. That is the key question of the survival uh, of, the, of the Islamic Republic, survival of the revolution, whose vision is going to prevail in the future. And that's why I think the system has decided that at this moment in time, it cannot really afford any kind of risk with opening up the system. And so it has decided to close it down. And, and if I can interrupt, was, should we understand these recent elections also um, as an exercise in positioning for the succession or more to um, prevent uh, the space for any dissent and challenges to the existing system? Well, I think it's the latter, but the reality is that it can be both. Uh, you know, we don't know. Uh, there is a lot of speculation that uh, uh, President Raisi is uh, basically being prepared for succeeding the Supreme Leader in the same way that the Supreme Leader himself was uh, president in the 1980s uh, 
uh, when Ayatollah Khomeini, the founder of the Islamic Republic, passed away, and he succeeded succeeded him as uh, supreme leader. Um, and uh, you know, in, in many ways, uh, uh, Mr. Raisi is a minimi of Ayatollah Khomeini, even in the way he dresses himself and in his uh, attitude, his uh, uh, narrative. Uh, he, he really imitates the supreme leader, and I'm sure he has the ambition. But whether the Supreme Leader and his office uh, also want uh, Mr. Raisi to become uh, the successor or, or is someone who's just laying the groundwork for whatever plans they have in mind for succession is, is, succession is something that we really don't know at this stage. I see. And, and um, that, that being said, um, do you expect or have you perhaps already seen meaningful changes in, in domestic policy um, by the new Iranian government? Or, or would you expect to see them in the months ahead? So uh, let, me, let me put it this way, that what we have in practice is, a, is, a, is minority rule uh, right now in Iran. Uh, it's a very limited uh, uh, number of people from the inner circle who are trusted, who are now running every single institution in Iran. There is no rival uh, faction uh, pushing for a different vision or a different policy. This is, I, I would even argue, the first time in the history of Islamic Republic since 1979 that you have such a unified rule uh, of a small group uh, of political elite. Um, a lot of people draw comparisons between uh, uh, this period right now and Ahmadinejad's presidency, uh, when the conservatives were also in control of, uh, seemingly in control of all institutions of power. But the reality is that Ahmadinejad himself, for instance, was not really appointed to any uh, position before he became uh, president by the supreme leader. He didn't owe his political success to the supreme leader. It was his own populist messaging and skills uh, that brought him up as... Uh, so he as, had a kind of independent power base. I think he was previously the mayor of Tehran. He um, was trying to create an independent power base. At some stage, you know, he, he came to power with a, with a, with a really populist uh, uh, narrative. Then uh, midway, he, he, he uh, turned around and started uh, using uh, ancient Persia's uh, symbols and, and narratives around the greatness of, uh, you know, Iranian monarchies of 2,500 years ago as a way of uh, mobilizing uh, support for himself. Mm -hmm. uh, so he evolved uh, or devolved, uh, however you want to put it, uh, over the years. But, but my point here is that, uh, you know, now you have a setup that the president, the head of the judiciary, the head of the parliament, everyone in every institution is or has been an appointee of Ayatollah Khamenei in the past. Mm -hmm. And so that's what, why they have created a very homogenized setup. And that's for two main reasons from what I've heard from Iranian interlocutors. Number one is that the system is dealing with too many crises at the same time. Iran has had economic problems in the past. Uh, it, it has dealt with unrest in the past. But it is now dealing with a confluence of crises from economic to environmental uh, to Iran's uh, instability in Iran's near abroad, you know, from uh, takeover of Afghanistan by the Taliban to tensions now between Iran and Azerbaijan and Turkey, uh, you know, the other side, Iraq going through elections, Iran's neighbors to the south uh, establishing relations with Iran's uh, arch rival in the region, Israel. Um, and there is unrest, there are short, shortages of electricity, protests, uh, and so it's, it's a really uh, tall order uh, that they have to deal with. And somebody uh, described it to me, a, a senior Iranian official described it to me as, you know, it's like we're driving towards a cliff and we can't afford to have the wheel and the gear in the hands of two different people who don't agree with one another. We need to have at least at this stage, put aside even the concept of pluralism because the priority is the survival of the system. And again, I think that's even overshadowed by uh, the bigger question of Ayatollah Khamenei's succession. Yeah, and, and this is quite a, a different perspective than the one we often receive in the Western media, which is basically that Iran is becoming a surrogate state of the... Um, uh, Revolutionary Guard Corps. You, you, if I understand you correctly, 
you seem to believe they have a role, they certainly have influence. But this concept that they are now in charge of the state um, is, is not really um, applicable. Yeah, I, I don't believe Iran has become a military dictatorship. Uh, without any doubt, the Revolutionary Guards is extremely powerful. Uh, but you know, at the end of the day, they're subservient to the Supreme Leader. Uh, and this system, at the end of the day, is a constitutional theocracy. Uh, and, you know, the Iranian clerical establishment still holds uh, enormous amount of power. They control religious and uh, revolutionary foundations that are uh, basically responsible for about a quarter of Iran's economy. Uh, and, you know, the, Iran, the, the Shia clerics uh, in Iran understand that it took them 14 centuries uh, to uh, ascend to the pinnacle of power. Uh, and, uh, you know, if they lose it to the military, it's a one way street. Uh, and so I don't think uh, the system is prepared uh, to, to just hand power to the Revolutionary Guards. But there is also a risk that the Revolutionary Guards has become so omnipotent and powerful and present in all sectors of the country, from politics to economy, uh, even to in, in cultural sphere, that in the absence of someone like Ayatollah Khamenei, uh, who uh, can rein them in, uh, there is a possibility that they would uh, be able to take over. So that risk exists, but I don't think the system deliberately is moving in that direction. And, and that may also, um, the, the potential scenario that you just described, um, that may also help explain the increasingly restricted political space at this particular historical juncture. W would you agree with that? Oh, absolutely. Again, I think we are in a situation that the system just doesn't want to take any risks uh, because, uh, you know, Ayatollah Khamenei is someone who came to power in 1989 as an underdog, uh, but managed to uh, outweigh and outwit everyone in the system, people who were much smarter, much better placed than him, and has now, I would argue, more institutional power uh, than any Iranian ruler in the past century. Uh, and, uh, you know, a, a, and this was done uh, through uh, calculated steps that he has taken. So I refuse to believe that a man like that does not have a plan for his succession. Uh, and uh, he knows that the survival of his vision, his legacy depends on who and what comes next. Uh, and so that's why in the past few years, we've seen uh, that uh, he intentionally has acted in ways that are, uh, you know, not in line with his previous pattern of behavior. Uh, he really did care about participation rate, but like, you know, in the presidential election this year, a participation rate in Tehran, the capital, uh, was below 25%. Oh. Um, in, in some of the previous elections, like in the parliamentary elections in some uh, provinces, there was really no competition. There was only one candidate uh, for a district, for instance. The others having been disqualified. Exactly. And so he has put aside the semblance of pluralism because he has bigger uh, fish to fry, basically. Right. Well, I, I'd like to return um, uh, to the question of succession um, uh, later in our discussion. But at this point, I think it would be interesting having described the domestic scene um, uh, to also look at Iran's uh, regional role and foreign affairs. And here, I think the obvious starting point would be um, the JCPOA, uh, the Iranian uh, nuclear agreement. Um, you have been following this very closely and I've heard from others that you also helped um, think through some of the proposals in 2014, 2015 that were actually incorporated um, in various forms into the agreement. I should add, if I'm not mistaken, um, you, you have a background in nuclear physics as well as political analysis. Um, uh, and from your understanding, where do things now stand with, um, with the JCPOA? I mean, on the one hand, uh, as you know, the US unilaterally renounced this international agreement. Then rather than rejoining it after Biden took office, they sought to um, renegotiate mutual compliance because in the U.S. view, Iran, um, while it never withdrew from the agreement, had violated certain aspects of it. So where do things stand and how do you view um, what seems to be growing pessimism uh, 
in the last month or two uh, that an agreement can in fact be reached. Right. Um, so look, uh, the negotiations are currently in a, in a state of suspended animation uh, since uh, uh, three and a half months ago. Uh, and the expectation is that the new Iranian government uh, will uh, eventually come to the table at some point in November. Mm -hmm. um, and, um, you, you know, would, would basically uh, try to pick up from where the previous administration, the Rouhani administration, left off. These are uh, the talks taking place in uh, in Vienna with all the parties to the agreement, plus the Americans. That's correct, and the and the and uh, the talks between Iran and the U.S. are uh, indirect through intermediaries, through other signatories to the deal, the Europeans, uh, the Russians, and the Chinese. Um, but um, you know, talks were at a deadlock uh, back in June uh, because of I would say mismatched expectations between the two sides. So the Iranians, uh, you know, as a matter of principle, uh, see themselves as the aggrieved party here. They were uh, fulfilling their obligations under the deal, um, uh, but um, you know, the U.S. withdrew from the deal. Iran stayed in it uh, even a year after Trump uh, ended U.S. participation in the agreement, in the hope that the Europeans would try to uh, help Iran uh, confront uh, the uh, ec economic uh, coercion that the Trump administration. The maximum pressure campaign, as it was. Exactly. Mm -hmm. um, and, and when that didn't work, Iran started uh, in an uh, incremental manner, uh, rolling back its own compliance with its nuclear obligations. Um, but, uh, you know, you know but, but the reality is that the U.S. administration, the Biden administration, has not treated, treated them as the aggrieved party. It has treated them as any other adversarial country that the U.S. is negotiating with. Mm -hmm. And in addition to that, it has um, you know, asked Iran to commit to a follow-on negotiation uh, to get what the Biden administration has called a longer and stronger nuclear deal. Uh, and and you know, uh, Biden, during uh, his, his presidential campaign, never mentioned return to the nuclear deal, the JCPOA, Joint Comprehensive Plan of Action, without also simultaneously mentioning that there is a need to, buy, to, to build a follow-on successor agreement uh, on top of it. Sorry, but I think during the campaign, um, Biden at one point even said that the U.S. expected Iran to return to full compliance first before the U.S. would rejoin the agreement. Is that right? No, that came after. That came during the transition, and then during the um, uh, the, the first few weeks of the Biden administration. Mm -hmm. um, and, and you know, the Iranian expectation was that uh, you know, given uh, that Biden and his team uh, are the same people in the Obama administration, negotiated, supported the JCPOA, that first of all there will be a mea culpa of taking responsibility for the fact that it was the U.S. that reneged on the agreement. And the economic damages caused by uh, the maximum pressure strategy, the Iranians estimate that it amounts to about a trillion dollars. Uh, and, uh, you know, they expected that at least there will be a mention of uh, regret uh, that this has happened. Uh, and that then the U.S. would do the same thing that it did uh, to restore its credibility on the international scene in reversing some of Trump's policies, like returning to Paris climate deal or returning to World, World Health Organization. They expected the same thing to happen on the JCPOA. When none of, that, none of that happened, and also uh, there was posturing on the U.S. side that Iran should take the first step to come back into compliance, I think it's hardened Iran's position. Now, I would argue Iran's position by that point already was pretty tough, and they had a set of unrealistic expectations. Uh, but but I, I would say the first few weeks of the Biden administration really made matters worse. There was no goodwill gesture, uh, no uh, humanitarian uh, relief uh, from sanctions so that Iran could purchase uh, COVID vaccines uh, or, or medical equipment. Uh, and all of that really uh, toughened Iran's position. And so the talks from the get-go uh, were, were pretty, pretty difficult, plus the fact that because there is no direct discussion between the Iranians and the Americans, there's plenty of room for uh, misunderstandings uh, well, and mis miscalculation. Yeah, just, just on this point, I think many people have questioned, um, I mean, it would seem to be a reasonable assumption, you know, Trump uh, withdrew from the agreement, and the expectation would have been that Biden would simply 
uh, rejoin it and then address any issues about um, uh, Iranian non-compliance with any aspects of the agreement from within the agreement. But as, as you pointed out, that never happened. What is your understanding of why the Biden administration has refused to rejoin the agreement, especially after all the criticism that his own people made of uh, Trump's uh, withdrawal from it? You think, uh, you know, I think there are two reasons for this. Number one is the fact that um, uh, the, the Iranian Supreme Leader had already, uh, by the time that Biden came to office, um, determined a set of uh, demands or red lines uh, that signaled to the U.S. that a unilateral U.S. return to the agreement is not going to work because it might fall short of Iran's expectations. For instance, the Supreme Leader had said in a vague manner that Iran expects all sanctions to be lifted. I mean, uh, just for listeners, maybe they don't know the details, but what the JCPOA did was basically to suspend sanctions. It didn't permanently lift them. Um, and, and so, and, and to do it in a verifiable manner, uh, which, you know, Iran's nuclear commitments could be verified by the International Atomic Energy Agency, the UN's nuclear watchdog. So there is a, a neutral, ref, you know, uh, referee here. But in the case of sanctions relief, it wasn't clear what the Iranians actually meant by verification. So there were questions of whether U.S. unilateral action would actually work. Uh, th that's that's one element. The second element uh, is that I think the president, President Biden, when he came to office uh, and, and saw the intelligence in terms of Iran's activities in Iraq against U.S. presence, Iran's support for the Houthis uh, in Yemen, um, you know, the tit for tat that happened between Iran and Israel uh, in, in the maritime realm, all of that signaled that Iran is extremely aggressive uh, and uh, it was perceived, I think, that unilateral uh, U.S. Uh, action would be misinterpreted by the Iranians as a sign of weakness uh, and, and might actually backfire. So it's a, it's a combination of those two factors, um, but, but also initially in the first few weeks of the Biden administration, there was a debate about the policy and there was consultation with allies, and that also slowed down uh, the process uh, and, and again, led to Iran uh, hardening its own stance. And um, if, if we look at the current situation, some people have suggested that given, um, and, and here I'd like to uh, refer to your background also as a scientist, that some people have suggested given Iran's activities in the nuclear realm uh, since 2019 um, and the additional knowledge and expertise that it has gained, that at this point, um, a Iranian compliance with the 2015 agreement may not even be worth it to the Americans, while at the same time, um, the Iranians had such a bitter experience with the Trump administration effectively making the Europeans accomplices to the maximum pressure that the Iranians may not be all that interested either. Um, but at the same time, they say there's a big difference between 2021 and 2011, which is that currently a full agreement or armed conflict are not the only options, that there could also be various informal understandings or limited agreements. Um, how, how do you see these issues? So look, I don't think uh, either side has made the strategic decision that uh, the nuclear deal is no longer serving their interest. Mm -hmm. um, I think there are tactical differences uh, in, in terms of how to return to mutual compliance with, uh, with the JCPOA. Mm -hmm. uh, but both sides uh, still see it in their interest. And at the end of the day, the alternatives to it are really not that much more attractive for either side either. Uh, I mean, take into account, for instance, that if the JCPOA completely collapses. And you know, I say it a a as a possibility because we might not have a moment of collapse. It might be a process, uh, but if the JCPOA collapses, it basically means that Iran's nuclear program will continue to grow. Uh, it's now one month away from uh, the, the point of breakout, which is uh, you know, an, an um, artificial concept, but basically is the amount of time that it takes to accumulate enough uh, 
fissile material for a single nuclear weapon. That doesn't mean you have the weapon, but it means you have the material to a we for a weapon, and then you have to fashion it into a weapon and weapon. So it becomes only a question of taking a decision rather than acquiring correct. additional scientific uh, expertise. That's correct, yes. But And the JCPOA extended that timeline to 12 months. Mm -hmm. um, and now, uh, as a result of the Trump administration withdrawal, which led to Iranian uh, violations of the deal, breakout time is at one month. Now, imagine if this process, if the deal collapses or uh, that we get into a protracted stalemate in the negotiations, which means that Iran's nuclear program will continue to grow, in a few months, Iran's breakout time will be near zero. Uh, and that would for sure uh, you know, raise alarm bells. And, and there is a possibility of an Israeli or uh, US, uh, or actually both, uh, taking military action against uh, Iran's nuclear facilities. Even if that doesn't happen, uh, you know, the JCPOA will become completely irrelevant uh, because Iran would make the kind of advancements in terms of research and development, the kind of knowledge that they will learn that you can't uh, bomb out of their head or, or wipe out out of their head of their scientists, that it would require a different deal. So the JCPOA uh, non-proliferation value will be completely lost. On the Iranian side, uh, it also means that Iran would have to continue to live under sanctions. Now, the new government in Iran, the Raisi administration's view, uh, is that they can survive uh, without sanctions relief. The reality is, you know, after the U.S. has basically thrown the entire kitchen sink at them, uh, everything that could be sanctioned has already been, been sanctioned, but they're still standing. Uh, and they believe that, you know, they might not be able to thrive, but they can survive. And the reality is that they have a much bigger space to ratchet up the nuclear program, ratchet down uh, the inspections, and also escalate in the region, especially against U.S. presence in Iraq and Syria, then the U.S. can match uh, their, their, their leverage. Um, because, again, the U.S. is almost maxed out. Mm -hmm. um, and, and so that creates uh, in the minds of the, of the new Iranian administration, this perception that time is on their side. Uh, and so that's, I think, the main reason that they have not returned to the negotiating table, but also that there is a real, I don't think it's just a rhetorical issue. There is real skepticism on, on the Iranian side that the U.S. can deliver on sanctions relief. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, because they've gone through this experience before. In 2016, sanctions relief really fell short of their expectations. Uh, other than oil and, and gas, uh, you, you know, their economy, their banking sector never went back to normal. Trade was never normalized. Uh, and, you know, they fear that Democrats might lose control over Congress in 2022 and might even lose the White House in 2024. Uh, and, and so, uh, and, and there are some in Iran who believe this kind of uncertainty that uh, is created as a result of the sanction switch being on and off uh, every two years or every four years is more detrimental to the Iranian economy than the predictability that they need to basically uh, count on their own resources and become self-sufficient. Uh, and so all, a combination of all of that, I think, has resulted in a a uh, very tough Iranian approach towards the negotiations, uh, which has created a lot of pessimism about the possibility of a breakthrough. Mm -hmm. and, and is your current expectation um, assessment that uh, the resumption of talks will or will not lead to uh, diplomatic success? Look, I think there is a narrow path forward, uh, but it requires both sides to demonstrate flexibility. If they go back to the table and pick up from where they left off with the same demands or even new or bolder red lines, the outcome is not going to be that different. Um, it really requires both of them to understand that status quo ante is not entirely restorable. Uh, but you know, if Iran gets 70 percent of uh, sanctions relief that uh, it, it wishes for, is better than zero. And if the US gets 70% of uh, non-proliferation value of the JCPOA, is better than zero. If they go in with that mentality, um, I, I think there is a path forward. But again, uh, you, you know, there is a lot of bad blood here. There is a lot of mistrust 
Uh, and so it's going to be a, an extremely difficult uh, negotiation. Um, and at the end of the day, you know, if they restore the JCPOA, then I think it's in their mutual interest uh, to negotiate a successor agreement because both sides were unsatisfied with the original agreement. The Iranians were unhappy with sanctions relief. They require sanctions relief that goes beyond what the JCPOA offered. And the U.S. was unsatisfied with some of the nuclear uh, restrictions. Um, and, and then eventually, you know, once you get a successor agreement, it would also hopefully be more sustainable, which is another major shortcoming of the JCPOA if we look at the record of the past four years. So you were saying earlier that um, Iran, from its own perspective, has um, escalatory dominance, uh, if I can use that term, over the United States. And I also recall an interview I, I, I did with you uh, a year or two ago in which um, you ascribed some of the difficulties in um, the current relationship between Iran and the United States and others as um, uh, the problem of the JCPOA coming before any agreement on a regional uh, security architecture. So turning now to the region, um, uh, despite these points that you've been making, Iran appears to have actually chosen a somewhat different path in terms of its participation in the Baghdad uh, dialogue hosted by the Iraqi government in which it is meeting with the Saudis, the Emiratis, um, others in the region. And there's even talk of a renewal of Saudi-Iranian diplomatic and consular relations. Um, should we see these uh, discussions as serious um, or are they kind of window dressing, or is there a real interdependence between what's happening in the region and what's happening internationally? So that's a very interesting question. Look, let me just make a distinction between uh, two processes that, are, that have happened in Baghdad. One is the uh, Iran-Saudi dialogue, uh, a four round of which have happened with Iraqi facilitation. Uh, and the, the Baghdad process, which is a broader process of uh, most of Iraq's uh, neighbors, uh, including Iran, uh, but it also goes as far as Egypt and, uh, and France uh, and some other participants. And there have been two meetings uh, so far, one in Baghdad, one a follow-up meeting in New York, and the third round will be in Amman uh, soon. Um, I'm not as optimistic about the latter as I am about the former, uh, in the sense that a broader group, I think, brings a, a lot of complexities to the table. If we're focused on uh, the Gulf, uh, per se, or let's, let's put it this way, six plus two, which are the six uh, GCC countries plus Iran and Iraq, I think you have a better chance of success than if you bring in other countries that brings other um, you know, the, the difficulties and complexities. You Including have. Iraq's close neighbor, France. <laughs> yes, absolutely. So there are too many uh, cooks in this kitchen, I think, and there are uh, too many, uh, uh, you know, ambitions and agendas. Uh, it, so I'm not, although I find it quite promising that uh, you know, leaders in the, in the region are now willing to actually be under the safe roof and talk to one another. That in and of itself, I think, is, is, a, is an important development. Uh, but I'm a bit uh, um, skeptical about the, the Baghdad process. Uh, but where I see potential is on, on Iran's relations with its uh, GCC neighbors. And, and here is where the situation is completely different than 2015 uh, when the JCPOA was finalized. Because at the time, uh, you know, the Saudis, the Emiratis, uh, the Bahrainis, uh, you know, they were uh, reluctantly willing to support the JCPOA, but they actually were pretty afraid that the JCPOA would unshackle in Iran and would result in Iran uh, basically uh, having a freer hand in, in pursuing its agenda of trying, in their view, to dominate the region. And this time it would be with the US's green light. So when they saw an opportunity in Trump to once again put Iran back in a box, they completely changed sides and, and supported the maximum pressure policy. Uh, and, and the difference we have now with 2015 is that uh, 
they maybe believe that the alternative would work better. Maybe pressure would work better than diplomacy. Maybe Iran back in a box would be better. Now, as a result of maximum pressure, they know that there is a cost associated with that policy, and they are the ones who will be paying that cost. It's and here you're referring, States. for example, to the 2019 attack on the Aramco uh, facilities in, in Saudi Arabia. Absolutely. Uh, and attacks on, for instance, the port of Fujaira uh, in the yeah. UAE, yeah. which created an interesting model that I think now Saudis are interested in. I, I would call it the Emirati model which is after that attack, uh, which I believe was in May of 2019, uh, the UAE sent a delegation to Iran uh, headed by security uh, establishment um, and, and had dialogue with their Iranian counterparts. There was a few rounds of discussions about maritime security. The Emiratis actually opened up a few financial channels to the Iranians, uh, uh, you know, despite uh, unhappiness uh, in the Trump administration, but that resulted in de-escalation between uh, Iran and the UAE. Um, and, um, uh, you know, the, the Emiratis basically through that engagement got themselves out of the line of fire. I think uh, the Saudis came to the same conclusion a bit later, uh, but also this perception that the US is not uh, a reliable uh, security guarantor for the Gulf countries has further helped with uh, these countries basically opening up more channels of communication uh, with Iran. But having said that, I think there's also a limit to how far th these processes can go. If Iran is de-escalating with, uh, with its neighbors in the Gulf, when it's simultaneously escalating with the West over its nuclear program. Mm -hmm. I think in that scenario, all you get is the UAE model. Uh, a certain degree of de-escalation, which could potentially shield the Gulf off of another round of uh, mutual escalation between Iran and the US. Um, but if the JCPOA is restored, then I think you have a much better basis to combine the effort of uh, diffusing the nuclear crisis with efforts of actually dialogue in the region that could go hand in hand in addressing some of the other concerns about Iran's uh, policy in the region, uh, be it its uh, support for proxies or uh, proliferation of uh, technologies like ballistic missiles or drones uh, to non-state actors in the region. And um, we've also heard that Israel is apparently quite disappointed with this um, uh, Baghdad uh, dialogue because it had been hoping to use its uh, newly formed uh, form normalized relations with some of the GCC states um, as an alternative point of pressure on Iran at a time when the US is indirectly re-engaging with it. And you know we've seen a continuation of Israeli uh, sabotage and assassination um, attacks on, on Iran. Where do you see that relationship uh, heading at, at, at it, given, given the regional and international environment we've been discussing? Uh, so that relationship is a real point of concern because uh, you know, on the Iranian side, you have a real desire uh, within the establishment uh, to restore deterrence with Israel. Um, Israel has conducted a number of uh, operations, covert operations on Iranian soil uh, which has been extremely humiliating to the Iranians, you know, from assassination of Iran's top nuclear scientist uh, last November, uh, Fahrizadeh, to, yeah. to uh, sabotage of Iran's uh, nuclear facilities uh, in Natanz and elsewhere, uh, and, and uh, some of the critical infrastructure in the country, uh, to cyber attacks, to attacks on uh, Iranian uh, tankers uh, throughout the world, by the way, it's not just limited uh, to the Gulf. Um, uh, it goes as far as the Mediterranean or, or the Red Sea, uh, and Iranian uh, retaliation of that, um, uh, you know, to uh, Israeli attacks on uh, Iranian military presence in Syria, uh, which has gone mostly unanswered uh, by the Iranians. There is, uh, you know, there was this demand uh, to restore deterrence with Israel uh, during uh, the Rouhani administration. Uh, but I think uh, uh, there was a debate within Iran's national security apparatus uh, and, and Rouhani really did not want to provide 
any kind of ammunition for Israel uh, to use against Iran uh, to, to derail nuclear diplomacy or, or at the time of the Trump administration to actually uh, provide some sort of a casus belli uh, that, that the U.S. would actually use to attack Iran. Mm -hmm. um, but now with this homogenized uh, leadership in Iran, uh, I think the Iranians believe that they have to uh, take, uh, uh, you know, the kind of action on Israeli soil that would restore deterrence. And that's a major concern because it can uh, obviously spiral out of control. Um, but I don't believe that Israel can actually do much to derail the kind of regional diplomacy that we were talking about uh, in the Gulf, because that's a decision uh, that, uh, that I think uh, you know, the, the Gulf leaders have come to, uh, and they know that Israel will not come to their, their defense. If the U.S. was unwilling to come to their defense, Israel uh, will not. They live right next door to Iran. Uh, and, and they need to figure out a way of managing their own differences with Iran. I think that decision has already been made, uh, but you know all, uh, that doesn't take away from the fact that more and more Gulf countries have relations with Israel as well, and that provides them with options for hedging their bets. Right. So um, finally, Ali, I'd, I'd like to return to the question of, um, of succession. And of course, um, you described Iran as a constitutional theocracy, um, and it has a um, uh, fairly complex institutional system. You know, you have um, an elected parliament and president, but supreme decision-making authority is not in the hands of either. Um, if I'm if I'm not mistaken, if we go back to the late 1980s, uh, Rafsanjani was a designated uh, successor until I, I don't I can't recall if it was uh, Ayatollah Khomeini who um, who subsequently anointed uh, Khamenei or whether he um, ascended after um, after Khomeini's uh, death. But looking at, at the situation now, do you expect the succession to unfold in a manner that is decided by um, the current uh, supreme leader? or once he has departed from the scene, will other um, centers of power be able to reach a, um, uh, a decision and appoint uh, new leaders that are perhaps at variance with, with, um, with the wishes of the current leadership? Um, so look, we only have one data set to look at in terms of precedence of, of succession in Iran, and that's 1989. Uh, and you know, if we had this discussion six months before Ayatollah Khomeini passed away, there was a designated successor in the form of Ayatollah Muntaziri, who was one of the Sorry, founders of the, of the revolution. Yeah. Um, and we knew that uh, you know the, the Assembly of Experts, which is this institution which is in charge of selecting the supreme leader, uh, would have to uh, elect uh, a successor who has to be an Ayatollah. Mm -hmm. Six months later, um, uh, Khamenei, who at the time was not even an Ayatollah and was not even a designated successor, became supreme leader through um, the kind of machinations that actually uh, Rafsanjani uh, brought to the fore. Uh, and he was, you know, he was known as Ayatollah Machiavelli in Iran in many ways, a very savvy political operator. Um, and that eventually, uh, you know, came uh, uh, to, uh, at his own detriment because uh, eventually Khamenei became so powerful that he completely even sidelined Rafsanjani. Yeah. But but just to say that, um, you know, uh, we we can't look just at the tea leaves and and try to to read them and predict what's going to come next because Iran is not really amenable to those kind of projections. But but um, there are a few things that I think are clear. Um, and, uh, and that's the fact that, you know, the, the difference between uh, right now or whenever Ayatollah Khamenei passes, and by the way, let me add this, that, uh, you know, his, he's 82 now. Uh, his father lived Some to- have lived longer. Yeah. His father lived to be 104. Uh, so he has good genes and, you know, who knows, maybe we'll, we'll have this discussion, uh, you know, 10 years from now, or, or maybe, you know, things would change in a week, who knows. Uh, but, but, but the reality is, 
um, you know, in 1989, uh, Khomeini's inner circle was really small, was his son. Uh, he was a traditional Shia Ayatollah. So his son was his office. Uh, like, you know, today, if you go to Sistani's office, you, you know, it's his son who's running it. Um, uh, and uh, Khamenei, who was at the time president, and Rafsanjani, who was at the time uh, the, the head of the parliament. That was his inner circle. Ayatollah Khamenei has a uh, office um, that is uh, um, projected to be 5,000 strong, uh, 5,000 people work there. And well, it's we an really, institution. It's an institution, it's a black box. We don't have a, a full understanding of the power dynamics within his office. Uh, and I think the, the, the succession will come out of that black box, which, by the way, includes his son, who's a very powerful uh, one of his sons was a very powerful actor in his office. And I think the office has an interest in preserving its own power because in the brutal, cruel politics of Iran, they have seen what happens to the families of former uh, you know, officials, supreme leader, former uh, presidents, uh, and, and it's not a happy story. And am so I, I, think am I that, correct that Montezari was placed under house arrest? Uh, that is correct. Uh, yes. Montezari was placed under house arrest. Uh, Rafsanjani's children were uh, imprisoned. Um, you know, Khomeini's grandson, uh, uh, Khomeini's son was uh, allegedly uh, eliminated, killed by, uh, by Khomeini and Rafsanjani. Um, Khomeini's grandson has tried to enter politics in different ways. He's never been allowed to. He wanted to run for president this year. Uh, the Supreme Leader told him not to. He wanted to run even for the Assembly of Experts, and they didn't allow him to, to, to become a candidate. Uh, and so they've been completely sidelined from politics. And I don't think that's what the current office wants to happen. Uh, and so they have an interest in trying to bring to power somebody who does not have a base of his own, and therefore will have to be re uh, reliant on the current office in order to govern. Uh, and in some ways, Raisi fits that profile. Um, but if, it, if the succession happens in the next few months or maybe you know, in the next year, but if it happens at the end of his presidency, he is going to more, more likely have uh, a better command of uh, you know, Iranian politics and, and, and also build relations with the military or even create a base of his own. So that's why I said I'm not 100% certain that Raisi is uh, the designated uh, successor at this stage, uh, but but I'm sure the office has a plan. Uh, it's just that we don't know what that is. Right, and we'll have to see um, uh, if if that plan is indeed uh, executed according to plan, um, which is always uh, which is always the other challenge. But on on that note. Um, Ali Vayaz, I'd like to really thank you for, for sharing your expertise and insights about Iran, its domestic politics, um, and its regional and international affairs with us on Connections. Thank you very much. An absolute pleasure. Thanks for having me. Thank you.